and, you know, some of the newbies. Because when we talk about 50 years, we have to talk about the entire 50 years, not just 10. Right. Just five. Right. If you're going to talk, you, you, you're going to talk about 1973 to 2023, then you got to talk all the way up to 2023. True. And that's a first. And a lot of people don't want to, don't, a lot of people, they act like they want to do the right thing, mm -hmm. act like they talk a good game. Right. And they act like they want to do the right thing and, 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 and talk about this, you know, this generation and that generation. And that's cool. But don't but if you're going to do it, do it right. Do it right. So when the kids can see me when they see me, they see somebody that's doing it right and doing it and doing it completely so they can relate to it. So because they, they this generation don't want to be left out. Just like the last generation don't want to be left. The first generation, they don't want to be left out. So what makes you think that it's okay to leave out somebody from 2005 to, you know, 2010? Malik's first job podcast here to answer any questions that y'all ask. Financial literacy and resources, parents and young people becoming bosses, CEOs, future leaders, entrepreneurs, conferences and boardrooms getting sponsors secured. If you want generational wealth, Brooklyn's own current fill up with information to help. Malik's first job podcast, Malik's, Malik's podcast, Brooklyn's own current fill up, current, current fill up. Malik's first job podcast, podcast, pod, podcast, Brooklyn Zone, current Phillip, generational wealth, wealth, wealth. Greetings, 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 what's going on? This is Curly Phillip here with another episode of the Malik's First Job Podcast, where we discuss leadership, entrepreneurship, and financial literacy for parents and teens. Today, I got my man, um, I don't know if I can say hip-hop icon, hip-hop legend, but um, we met several years ago at the uh, hip hop induction ceremony for the, uh, the Funky Four Plus One More. So X was there that day. Um, Elder Sensei got inducted that same day in DC. And at that time, you had announced that she was. Um, you had a radio show coming out um, on on the Rock the Bells platform. And you had some tapes, right? So right now we got my man Geechee Dan, the host of the Planet of the Tape show that you can find on the Rock the Bells um, station uh, on Cyrus XM. So today we're gonna talk about, you know, the tapes that he has and, you know, how he fought, how, how those tapes, how he leveraged those tapes to form a business and to start a pursuit in entrepreneurship, right? So what's going on, DJ? How you feeling today? Hey, brother, I'm doing well. Here go the tapes right here for all those. Yeah, yeah. Here's some of the tapes right here. Yeah. There's a tape so, right for those, here. So this real tape, quick, for this, those, it gets you real quick. So for those that aren't familiar, right? I know like nowadays with the technology, people have never probably seen a cassette tape before, right? So I know like coming up as a kid um, in New York, you know, we used to get these you know, cassette tapes and record off the radio because, you know, hip hop wasn't, you know, as widely spread as it is right now. So we would record our music, you know, from like either Red Alert, you know, Chuck Chill Out, uh, Mr. Magic um, and other, you know, other radio shows that existed at that point in time. But um, and we would have our music to have throughout the week. We play on our radios, Walkmans and so on. So you have a collection of these cassette tapes, right? Where you have yes. a lot of classic yes. uh, hip hop moments, hip hop shows, concerts, radio programs. Yeah. Yeah. Can you kind of elaborate, tell people about okay, what these tapes are, what's on? Sure. Um, if you look where I have my tape right there, it says right. 126 Park. This is a park in East Elmhurst, Queens. You see the date. August 21st, 1977. Okay? That's one tape. That's one of my oldest tapes. I have another tape right now. It's This one is from Harlem World. This okay. tape is from 18, I believe, 1982. And wow. so, so that's two, two of my tapes 
that I have a collection of over, I have a, probably about a, a thousand tapes. Wow. Of wow. park jams, block parties, some of those house house parties, um, let's see, park jams, block parties, clubs, skating rings, live performances. Um, some of the clubs were um, the, ho the Hotel Diplomat, Constellation, um, Harlem World, Tea Connection, Savoy Manor, um, Stardust Ballroom. You got 123 Park in the Bronx. Um, let's see. The Disco Fever. So these are the, some of the spots in the Bronx, Manhattan had spots in, you had the, the Encore in Queens, you had IS-8, you had Jamaica Roller Dome, you had uh, Baisley Park, Lincoln Park, 40 Projects Park, you had um, Mysteries, you had the Q Club, you had, um, 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 there's a club, um, there's a club that Snoop came to. Mm-hmm. Amazora, that was in that's in Queens too. That came, you know, lit parties in Queens later on in the nineties. So you had all these clubs. Um, I got tapes of all from all these spots, right? As well as New Jersey, I got some tapes from you know Connecticut, um, DC. So you know, uh, of different artists: Ice Cube, Snoop Dogg, Jay Z. LL Cool J, MC Shan, um, Rakim, Big Daddy Kane, Bismarcky, Mikey D, Treacherous Three, Funky Four Plus One, the original Funky Four from '78 with Raheem. I got some with not with not Raheem when they when they um became the Funky Four Plus One, the Furious Five, Grandmaster Flash, Grand Wizard Theodore, Funky Fantastic Four, uh, excuse me, Fantastic Five, L Brothers. Um, right. the, the, Wiz, the Wiz Kid that's no longer here with us. Red Alert, Jazzy J, Jazzy Five MC. Um, you know the Cold Crush, the Fearless Four, the Crash Crew. Uh, Bamba, mm -hmm. I got tapes from um, Bronx River Projects, So Sonic Force, Cosmic Force, Africa Islam. You know, um, Queen Lisa Lee. Um. You know, then I got some tapes from Harlem, from Hollywood, the original, you know, DJ Hollywood, Eddie Chiba, um, Dougie Fresh, Johnny Wall, um, Kate, uh, Ray Vaughn, you know, so, you know, um, Feel It's Four, um, Romantic, uh, Master Dawn, Death Committee, mm -hmm. um, Jekyll, Mr. High, they was the original, they was originally called DJ um, Ronnie Green in the Get High Crew. Okay. Um, Star Child, the, the original Star Child, Cool Cow, the Star Child from the Bronx. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so the Mark Five MCs, Hypnotizing, Lightning Land, some other local groups from the Bronx. They didn't really didn't make a lot of noise. Um, you know, as as well as like as we know as the Cold Crush and 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 the Funk Four and the Jazzy Five, JBD, Wanda D. Um, so when we be Chief Rocket Busy B, all these pioneers, all mm -hmm. these individuals, the disco twins from Queens, DJ Devon, Infinity Machine from Queens, King Charles, mm -hmm. New Sounds from Queens, that did a lot of the, the park jams early on in Queens and Brooklyn, like 75, 76, and 77 with the tape that I just showed you. This was uh, a park jam with New Sound. Um, right. You know, so, you know, when we talk about preserving history, when we talk about preserving hip hop in particular, you know, then we have to talk about everyone that contributed to right big pot of gumbo I call hip hop. Um, right. Somebody said, you know what, let's start off with the simple recipe. And as time went along, different individuals decided they wanted to be uh, they wanted to contribute to this big pot of gumbo somebody bought a carrot somebody did say hey look let's throw some onions in here you know right. 
You know, you got people that don't, that's allergic to shellfish like myself, so they don't obviously can't throw shrimp in there and the regular gumbo re recipe. So, you know, like, let me throw some steak in here. Let's throw a piece of chicken. And that's what ultimately with hip hop became. You had everybody throwing in their little flavor, their own little recipe, their own little seasoning. And as hip hop grew, the, the pot, the gumbo got, it grew. You know, yeah. now the pot has now shrimp in it. It got steak. It got Cajun shrimp. It got chicken. It got, uh, you know, it got something, you know, something that may not even was in the original recipe, but you know what I'm saying? It came along as as years as the recipe grew and it went, you know, all over the, all over the different restaurants all over the world. Hey, right. can I have some celery in it? Well, there's no celery in it. Well, maybe I need to add some celery. And that's how I, that's how hip hop is. One big mm -hmm. part of the world. Right, right, right. So I know you like those cassette, those tapes again. Um, and you listen to a whole lot of names that probably most people never heard of. You know? <laughs> yeah, probably. And, you know, as we, uh, you know, people celebrating this year, the 50th anniversary, mm -hmm. you know, of, of hip hop. Um, I think it's important that, you know, these tapes exist and people are able to hear these tapes because it's like, uh, yeah. it's like it's almost going into the pyramids of, of, of Giza and unlocking a chamber that people never, <laughs> you know, heard of before. You know, because right. like I said, growing up in New York, you know, we had access to some of this, inf some of these, um, some of this stuff. Like I know some of this stuff predates the time when I came into the culture. You know, I came as a kid, you know, mid eighties, but as you had stuff from like 77, 78, which is probably like my older cousin's generation as they right. were, you know, forming the culture. Now, how were you able to collect? You said you have over a thousand tapes. Yeah, that's, now this how are you able to collect over that number of tapes? Now, I know when I had my collection, I may have had a couple hundred, you know, and that was then. But you know, a thousand that that's a lot. Well, it started out. It started out as a hobby. We're talking. I'm. We're talking about forty. We talking about forty three years ago. Mm -hmm. I'm talking. We're talking about twelve, thirteen years old. Right. Back in like 82, 81, 81, 82. Um, the first tape that I heard ironically wasn't the Kumo D Busy B battle. It was the Cold Crush. It was, excuse me, it was the Treacherous Three second anniversary jam at Harlem World in 1982. Okay. And that tape I was so members, you know, I, I was like glue. I was like, oh my God, this is crazy. You know, Cat Grand Co, Co Crush 4 was on the tape, Treacherous 3. And um, I wanted to emulate what I was hearing. So that caught that caught my attention, you know, of hearing, man, something new, something fresh something amazing, something positive, something that I'd never heard before. And it wasn't like, you know, it, it was like, damn, I can do this. And I just got, and as I, as time grew that I can do it, I also kept co collect, you know, kept collecting the tapes, meeting people from the Bronx and from Manhattan. As I started getting into the workforce in 1983, I was 16 years old, started working at First Boston at the World Trade Center. So we had, you know, people from Brooklyn, had people from Washington Heights in Harlem. We had people from um, the Bronx and I was from Queens. So we all got together. We, we shared a lot of interests, different interests and, and, and hip hop was one of them. And so um, as the tape, as I, started listening to the tapes and collecting the tapes in my neighborhood. I was known as somebody that was collecting tapes and getting all the parties. And I wasn't getting the whole 60 minute tape at the time. I was just getting maybe 10 minutes of it, maybe 15, 20 minutes of it. I was getting snippets. Right. But and I told myself as time went on, one day I'm going to get all of them. In its entirety, I'm gonna get the whole party. I'm gonna get the whole entire park jam because I was remember you know memorized by 
from what I was hearing. And I was like, yo, this shit is dope. Yo, I want to, you know, so I, what happened was I started emulating and I was like, yo, I needed a name. My favorite movie at the time was Uptown Saturday Night with Harry mm -hmm. Bell that just passed away. Rest in power to him. And Bill Cosby and, uh, and um, Sidney Portier, rest in yeah. power, you know, as well. That was one of my, you know, let's do it again. And mm -hmm. Uptown Saturday Night was was my movie. And yeah. I took on the character as Geechee Dan. My real name is Daniel. Everybody was into, you know, nicknames at the time. And so mm -hmm. I said, hey, Geechee Dan, Geechee Dan this. And instead of saying their name or the ones that I was hearing on the tape, I decided to say, hey, my name. Right. So that led me into more, more loving more of the culture of the MC side, and then also as well as collecting the tapes. Because nobody wasn't really had wasn't nobody like that in the hood. You know, they might have had one or two tapes, but right. I was gun hold on getting every tape out that I can get. And wow. meet everybody in, in New York that had them. Wow. wow. And, wow. and, and, it, and it, it went from 1982. By, by the time 1985 hit, I already had about, at that time, I probably had about, hmm, about close to 100 tapes at that time. Okay. We're, now, we're talking about Funky Four tapes, WizKid, Zula Nation tapes, Cold Crush but I also started getting tapes from Queens and from Long Island. So, cause I wanted to be diversified in my tape collection. I just didn't want a hundred tapes of Cold Crush or a hundred tapes of Treacherous Three. I wanted people to hear different flavor from different, uh, different boroughs and, you know, different towns. And that's the beauty. That's another thing about hip hop. As hip hop grew, you couldn't contain, and other people wanted to get down, but they didn't want to sound like the Cold Crush. They didn't want to sound like the Treacherous Three. Everybody wanted to sound like their own, their hometown. And that's the thing about how hip hop is today. It grew like wildfire, and then ultimately, instead of the South trying to sound like New York, you had the South just being themselves, doing them. And then you had Compton doing Compton. Right. And you had the right. Bronx doing the Bronx. You had Queens doing Queens. You had Nelly doing Nelly, the South, the Midwest. And then and then the and ultimately now it's, it's global. It's worldwide. You got Japan doing Japan. They even yeah. got Korea doing Korea. They got some of the best DJs in Korea and Japan. Some of the fastest, nicest DJs you ever heard in your life. Right. They right. they took and they enjoy, they loved our culture. Some of mm -hmm. some even do it better than how we do it here in the States. Right, right, right. So let me ask you this question. So what are your thoughts real quick on, because oftentimes we see that the the core elements of hip hop, you know, people mm -hmm. often in the States focus on, I guess the mainstream audience of hip hop focuses on the, the rap or the MC. Right. right? When we look overseas, international, they embrace everything from the yes. MC, great DJ, dance, breaking, you know, the graffiti, you know, uh, writing, you know. So, what are your thoughts on the, the fact that internationally they embrace the full spectrum, whereas here in the states, it's only like one dimensional? Because I think that people. I think people just gravitated towards the MCing part because of the way the rap part, the rap blew up, became global. But breakdancing became global too. Right. Uh, graffiti became global too. But when you concentrate on just one element, you know, just you know that then you just get that side of it. You don't get the whole five elements or four elements. You don't even get knowledge no more. Knowledge is also, a, you know, from you know me being a former member of, you know, some a member with Sula Nation, you know, knowledge is 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 one of the elements of 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 hip hop culture. Right. You got to know where it came from, and a lot of people don't really don't like to hear about or read about 
the culture. They just wanted, they so, you know, now it's like they want to be able to instantaneously see and hear. So yeah. that's what they gravitate towards to seeing and hearing the first thing that, and that's the rap and the DJing. Mm -hmm. If you, but, and, and unfortunately, our brothers and sisters overseas um, did, they, did their homework, have done their homework. Right. Now, do you think it's a thing whereas it was just too available to us? Because sometimes when you're used to a situation, you kind of take it for granted. Yes, I believe that. And I believe that it, historically, graffiti, see, graffiti wasn't a really a big thing in Queens. Breakdancing okay. wasn't a big thing in Queens. So that's why a lot of Queens people concentrate on the rap part of it, because that was the part that, and the DJing, like the Bronx was big on the break dancing and you know the the graffiti. So when Bambada took So Sonic Force, Busy B, Crazy Legs, Rocksteady Crew, he took a uh, Cold Crush. When he took them to Japan back in 1983, mm -hmm. he opened the door to expose all elements. That's why Japan is really ahead of us. Because they got first taste of all elements. Where Run DMC, when they went to Japan, they just got exposed to the rap element of that. Right, right, right. Peace. Are you looking for a way to teach your kids about money management and responsibility? Look no further than the Greenlight card. The Greenlight card is a debit card for kids that parents can manage through an app, giving you complete control over where and how much your child spends. With the Greenlight card, you can start teaching your kids valuable financial lessons while earning rewards at the same time. For more information about Greenlight and to get started, please click the link in the show notes below. Thank you. Right. And I remember even as a kid, you know, um, growing up within the culture, you know, within hip hop, you know, we, we did everything, right? Because yes. I remember being in elementary school, you know, we had a little rap group in the class. We all used to break dance, battle each other. You know, we all used to write graffiti, you know, and all that. So it's like, but we don't see that now as kids who, you know, like the young people now that, are in, that say they're into hip hop and rap and stuff like that, they don't get that exposure to the other elements of it. Right. Like, again, here it's not as as uh, as popular as right. we see all these. We, I, I try to, I try to bridge the gap from what what from what was to what is. You kind of. Right kind of spoon, you got to spoon feed people bits and pieces. They cannot, you know, today's generation is not able to digest the whole enchilada. You know what I'm saying? They can't, they, they not can't, they, you got to, they barely, go, they barely, their history today don't even go as far as back as Tupac. Nevertheless, run them see and, and the first generation. So you got to spoon feed them. And that's what I try to do on my social media. I try to show the world through my social media um, and crack and congratulate everybody. I try to give hip hop one on one on first generation, second generation. I talk about the tapes. I talk about the flyers. Mm -hmm. I talk about the music. I talk about the the fashion, but it all comes down to just have to you have to put all of this and it takes it's a lot it's a lot of time and a lot of energy and it's it's time consuming to do everybody because you can you don't want to leave nobody out because everybody contribute so i do post of co crush and melly mel and treacherous three and jazzy five and imperial brothers and then i'll turn around and do post of crazy legs and and then i'll do a post about mc hammer and and, and cool keith and, and MC Stan and Big Daddy Kane and Rock Kim, and then I turn around and do something like Ludacris. I just posted today about him on the on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Congratulations right. to Ludacris and LL, and you know some of the newbies. Because when we talking about fifty years, we have to talk about the entire fifty years, not just ten. Right. Just five. Right. If you want to talk, you you, you want to talk about nineteen seventy three to twenty twenty three. Then you got to talk all the way up to 2023. True. And that's a work. And a lot of people don't want to, don't, a lot of people, they act like they want to do the right thing. 
Mm-hmm. They act like they talk a good game. Right. And they act like they want to do the right thing and, 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 and talk about this, you know, this generation and that generation. And that's cool, but don't, but if you're going to do it, do it right. Do it right so when the kids can see me, when they see me, they see somebody that's doing it right and doing it and comp- doing it completely so they can relate to it. So, because they, they, this generation don't want to be left out. Just like the last generation don't want to be left. The first generation, they don't want to be left out. So what makes you think that it's okay to leave out somebody from two, 2005, two, two, you know, 2010? Don't leave them out either. So it's a lot of work. And a lot of people don't want to put in the work. You can't leave folks out. That's not, that's not right. But you want to educate at the same time. So if you're going to do it, do it right. Say that this was doing it in 1974. Say that one was doing it in 1976. Queens was doing this in 1976. Bronx was doing that in 1976. Brooklyn was doing this. You know, this was, like I said, this is one pot of gumbo. Break dancing was going on here. Pop locking was going on here. Uh, these type of turntables was out then. These tape, you know, tech, tell the whole, tell everything. The fashion, the sneakers, same thing. The gazelles, the boombox radios, all of it ties in hand to hand. Right. In chronological order. But like I said, this is a lot of work. A lot of people want to, you know, they want to shortcut, take shortcuts. A lot of people want to just concentrate on one generation. Some want to concentrate on break dances. Some want to just talk about the Bronx. They don't want to talk about nothing else but Bronx. And that's cool. But I cho- I just chose to incorporate and talk about everything and everybody that contributed to hip hop. Right, right, right. I don't mind doing it. It's, it's very easy for me to do. <laughs> right, right. So, so you have the tapes that you've collected. Now, how are you able to, um, like, what made you introduce the tapes to the world? What was that process? Um, I had, well, let me backtrack now. Back in 2007, mm-hmm. my cousin, Uncle Boogie, that's um, WTX FM radio in Kokomo, Indiana, table set of radio. He was living in Atlanta. I was living in Atlanta. And um, he came by my house, you know, he went here, he was going through some issues and stuff. And so I said, why don't you just sleep? Why don't you sleep in one of the rooms downstairs? And um, as I was preparing the room for him, I had boxes of tape. Mm-hmm. Some of them were collecting, you know, cobwebs and spider webs on them, you know, all that. Right. And he said, yo, cuz, how many tapes you got? I said, ah, shit, probably two, three hundred, probably about 300 tapes, dude. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Some of them I listen to them on a regular basis because I do have my favorite tapes, and then some of them I don't listen to them like that on a regular. Right. I was popping tapes in my double cassette deck at the time, playing some tapes, and he's like, "Yo, you got to tape that." I said, "Yeah, yeah." He said, "Yo, you need to do something with these tapes. This is history." I said, "Yeah, yeah, well, well, yeah that's sounds like a good idea, but I got to go to work for a living, you know." And <laughs> I got to go to AT&T and I got a mortgage to pay and blah, blah, you know what I'm saying? So I was like, yeah. oh, that's, that's. so that was actually a confirmation. Mm-hmm. Second confirmation was from DJ Red Alert. Big salute to, you know, to Red Alert. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He lived in Atlanta in Atlanta metropolitan area. And um, he did, he lived not too far from where I lived in, in um, Gwinnett County. And I used to run into him and bumping him all the time. And I was like, yo, I'm, you know, I'm still down with Zula Nation and I got tapes and I want to play tapes on the radio. Mm-hmm. He said, yo, if you got tapes like that, brother, go for it. Enough said. Third confirmation was um, Frank Ski from V103. Okay. He did a morning show on V103 with Wanda Smith back and he was the number one, he had the number one show, morning show in the in the country. Right. And I had wrote a book called The Kingdom Hall No More back in 2008. I published on Author House. And um, I called into the radio station and we was talking about Obama running for president. Okay. And I told him that I had wrote a book about, 
you know, Jehovah Witnesses, and I would like to see more ex-Jehovah Witnesses or former Jehovah Witnesses vote for this first, mm -hmm. you know, this type of, you know, this special presidential election. Right. And um, he said he didn't, they both, him and Wanda was like, we didn't know that Jehovah Witnesses didn't vote. I said, yeah, they you don't vote, you know. Mm -hmm. So I told him, I said, he said, well, why don't you bring up the book up to the radio station and pass it out? I said, okay, cool. So I brought up some copies of my book up to the radio station of E103. And Frank Ski, I said, yo, Frank, I have a tape of you at Harlem mm -hmm. when you was a teenager in 1981 at a rap, uh, amateur rap contest. Ironically, it's side A of the professional contest where they had four MCs in the Kumo D Busy B battle and Cold Crush and Dr. Rock and Four MCs and Johnny Wall. He said, You got that tape? Mm. I said, Yes, I have that tape. He said, I've been looking for that tape for 25 years. Wow. And I wow. said, Wow. Just like you just said, Wow. I said, Wow, get out of here. He said, Yo, can you? I said, enough said. You ain't got to say no more. So the next couple of days, I bought up. I, I, I kind of got, gave like a Christmas gift. You know what I'm saying? I wrapped it up and came down and gave it to him. I gave him a CD and I gave him a tape, copy of the tape. That's he good. said, yo, you need to do something with these tapes, man. I mean, you got to. He said, I couldn't find this tape. Bismarck, he didn't have it. And Red Alert didn't have it. No one had this tape. Wow. This side A. Everybody had side B. But no one right. had side. So I said, yo, no problem. He said, yo, do something with them tapes and then, you know, I'll, I'll help you. I said, okay, cool. That was the third confirmation. So let me see how, so let, let me tell, tell you how God works. You know, I was married in my second, you know, my second marriage at the time and it just didn't work out. Mm -hmm. Everything that I tried to do right just wouldn't, just was not working. And it backfired and everything that I did was wrong. It's just everything. Mm -hmm. So God opened up the door. He's okay. like, you want to do this? Fine. But your situation, what we have now is everything that you're going to have to lose. Okay. And I was, in, I, I was like, okay, well, and I lost everything. Lost my house, lost my car, lost my job, lost my freedom for two weeks for, for suspended license in Georgia and lost my marriage. Yo, I lost everything. And so me losing everything, you know. Um, Malik's first job, Financial Principles for Teens, is an excellent resource to get your children started on understanding the basics of financial literacy. This book, which is set in Brownville, Brooklyn, about a young man who gets his first job and then shortly thereafter sits down with his dad to learn how to manage his money. There are several topics that are covered within this work, uh, such as paying yourself first, disciplining your spending, knowing the difference between an asset and a liability, creating multiple sources of income, as well as the importance of being charitable. So again, if you want to get your children started on understanding finance and becoming responsible adults, we highly recommend that you purchase the book, Malik's First Job, Financial Principles for Teens. So please visit maliksfirstjob.com to get more information. Peace. Um, so that's how that happened. Um, I lost everything and now I'm reverted back to sleeping on the couch at my first ex-wife's apartment. And while I was okay. sitting there on the couch, my son at the time was 16 years old and he was like, and I was crying on his bed, sitting on his bed with him talking and I was crying. And he was like, you need to go back to New York and do a live your dream. This is what you love to do. This is easy for you to do. You play these tapes all the time. You know all these people. You got these these people's phone numbers in your phone. You got all tapes of them. Why don't you just go back to New York and do a show? Do 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 something with. You lost everything here in Georgia, right. and go back to New York. 
after not being in New York in some, you know, 20 years plus, I was a little receptive about that. I was like, I don't know about going back to New York because I always used to say when I had my big ass home in Georgia and I had the Lexus and I had the 50, you know, the, the, uh, the you know, I had the, I had joints, you know, I had a hundred dollars, a hundred year, a hundred thousand dollar year job, you know? So I'm like, man, I ain't going back to New York. I got the picket fence, you know what I'm saying? Right. So, Live an but, American dream. Yeah, man, but I wasn't happy. The, the bottom okay. line, I wasn't happy because I used to hear, you know, what was being played on the radio. I was watching what was being, you know, put on TV, and I was playing tapes in my car. You know, I was playing CDs in these park jams, and I seen respect for hip hop just go right out the window. It's like it wasn't there. And I seen the teach wasn't being relevant, the flyers, nothing about our culture was being, seemed like it was being perceived as anything good. Right. Anything rich and powerful. All I kept seeing was the ignorance. And, and I didn't like it. I hated it. I hated that these pioneers and these icons and legends were reduced to just like everything they did was, er was, getting, er was getting erased. Right, and he wasn't speaking up for them. Mm. So I took, I said, you know what? I'm going back to New York. I started a show called the Geechee Dan Hip Hop Tape Show, where I play tapes, and I have the individuals, the pioneers, the legends, and the icons that's on the tapes. I have them come on my show, and we discuss the tape okay. of that party or club or whatever mm -hmm. they was performing at. So I had, you know, Mr. Freeze, rest in power to him. I had Power Wild. I had Glow. I had Queen Lisa Lee. I had Shy Rock. I had Little Rodney C. I had um, Ike C. I had um, Mikey D. I had, I started having all these people come on my show and like, Geechee, we love what you're doing. Keep it going. Keep it going. So I said, you know what? I started out on um, Blog Talk Radio, mm -hmm. and it just went from an audio show to a live streaming show. Now the world can now see the pioneers on the tapes. On Blog Talk Radio, they was hearing the tapes, right. and it wanted to be a, a worldwide situation. But now with live streaming, mm -hmm. I can do. Not only they can hear, but they now they can see. Right. right. So now the, my dream went from them just hearing the tapes worldwide to now seeing, hearing and seeing the tapes and pioneers worldwide. Right. And then I told LL Cool J about it back in 26, no, 2015, I told him about it, 2016. He said, yo, that's dope. That's dope. Mm -hmm. And he wanted me to interview him, and I didn't have no platform to really interview him. I didn't really didn't want to interview him with 10 viewers, 20 right. viewers, 100 viewers. I wanted thousands. I wanted millions to see this iconic interview. Right. I wanted people to hear these iconic tapes. So I didn't want it to be – I wanted it to be a big situation. I didn't just want it to be just a live streaming show or a blog talk radio show or FM radio show. I wanted to be bigger than that because hip hop deserved for that to be big. It's global now. And the big yeah. the thing for me, I always want I always tell people, I want to be global. I want anything that I do has to have an impact on the culture. I yeah. have to do something that has to have an impact. And it has to be iconic. Those are the three things that I'm really big on. So when LL came at me, you know, approached me about Having my show on on Sirius XM on Rock the Bells, it was that was that was perfect. Go, 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 go. Yeah. So so um so those tapes really took you. You know, it got you through over a hump to where you are right now. Right. Yeah. It saved my life. It saved my life, man. Um, these tapes got me through all the years of being hurt, being disappointed, not able to do what I wanted to do in hip hop right, right. and um, do those dog days, 
and those in the days that I was going through divorces and and in jail and you know you know you know suspended license and and just things wasn't working out in my life. Yeah. And I it, it, the tapes was there to say, hey, remember this in 1982. The cold crush went that fantastic, and you remember this with the Kumo D, and you remember this one at the Park Jam, and you remember this as you got older. You 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 know you and LL used to rhyme on Farmers Boulevard, and you remember this when you went to this show at, at the Garden and were running them, and you remember this when you was down. I was down with BAU Radio at Delphi University, so I had tapes of you know ch early Chuck D before they was even Public Enemy, Flavor Flavor um, Dr. Dre from UNTV Rap. I had, you know, Townhouse 3, all these people were for, on BAU, so I had tapes of that too, and I was part of that that movement. Right. So I, it's, it's, it was bringing back a lot a lot of great memories. Yeah. And it said, I can't ever go backwards, but I'm going to live my dream. I'm going to make it happen. So therefore, let me come back to New York and make it happen. And that's just what I did. Right. So now we, you know, we speak about again this uh, this year marking the fiftieth anniversary, and again you having like this uh, this archive of information, archive of history that mm -hmm. really should be celebrated because with you know without you know these cassette tapes, people wouldn't would, some people wouldn't know that these park jams existed. It would just be like hearsay or fairy tale. But you can you can show proof. You know, okay, listen to this. You know, you can speak about the uh, you know the different battles that took place, the different shows, and it really helps those that were there to to reminisce about. It takes them back to that day and time, right? You know, so what you really have is really a monumental, you know, to the culture. You know, it's very important that you have to have these uh this archive of information. You know. So, so what are your plans, you know, moving forward with, you know, with the cassettes and the tapes that you have? So, um, the next step with the tapes is basically turn it to a, just like I did for Sirius XM, so, so people all over the world can hear. Now, we want to do something like a documentary and plus do a TV show. Okay. So now, sure. that completes the tapes portion of the dream where now I have a television show based around the tapes just like it's just like an audio show called Planet of the Tapes on Sirius XM. Right. So basically it's, it's the TV show based upon the radio show. Okay. Okay. Now, do you have a collection of like videotapes as no. well? No. Ralph McDaniel, he's the one that had, he got oh, yeah. he the videotapes. He's the, he's wow. the tape He's the videotape king. I'm the audio tape king. Wow. And are, are there any plans for you all to, to kind of collaborate? And yes. Come together with some stuff? Yes. We, we, we discussed that the other day. Yeah. Dope, dope, dope. So, and so what's been the reception so far, you know, from like the pioneers and people who listen to the radio show on XM? What kind of feedback have you received so far? Positive. Everyone loves the show. The pioneers... Yes. I never had all the pioneers love the show. They love what I'm doing. Um, I'm having a lot of problems with the people that's not really that they not they're not the pioneers. Okay. It's just you know different organizations. You know they having problems with me. I think because I came back to New York and made it happen, and they're still trying to make it happen with their situation. Okay. Okay. That's kind of, kind of from what I'm getting or what I'm hearing, but for the most part, the pioneers. I never had a problem with none. Of, not one pioneer, not one. But every pioneer has have given me their phone number and said, "Yo, we appreciate what you're doing, man. If you ever need me, give me a call." Okay. Okay. Dope. So I, I never had a problem with the pioneers. No, not one. Not one pioneer has has you know like complained about what I'm doing or. Of what I've done for them. Right, 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 right. So, are you still, I guess, collecting tapes today? As far as I know, we mentioned that you know, going from the full fifty-year spectrum, like let's say the um, the modern day, you know, uh, the, the generation that's out now, 
right? Of course, they don't have cassette tapes, but you know, where do you get the archive, get their information, or get their content? You know, are you collecting that as well? Like, getting yeah, stuff from the place today? I got, I have um, 50 cents. I have some live performances when he first started out. I have some Ja Rule. But as uh, I, you know, two live crew I got, and 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 um, Biggie and Nas, Ice Cube, Snoop. But when we talk about J Cole and Drake, Kendrick Lamar, um, that's going to be a challenge. Okay. Okay. So, but eventually, in time, their live performances will be will be there their jams or their concerts or their performances and ultimately I will have that too in time. Yeah. Right, right. But I think I think right now as you think about it, um, you know, you could probably get a lot of that stuff on YouTube. Like on YouTube and stuff like that. And it's already being archived now. Um, exactly. Whereas back then, you know, you had to be there to get it and it wasn't as widespread. Right? Exactly. So so yeah, yeah, yeah. But I guess eventually you know, as time progresses, we'll see how things uh, trickle down. You know, because you because let's say thirty years from now, that concert of Jay Cole at, M at Madison Square Garden, thirty years from now is going to be like, yo, did you see? Did you have that? You know, when Jay Cole first performed that so and so, you know, it'll, it'll have more uh, historical reference then than it does right now. Exactly, because as time goes on. We're not going to be talking about 50 years in hip hop. We're going to end up talking about 100 years in hip hop. Right. 75 right. years in hip hop. Right. right. So we have to include the first generation, the second generation, the third generation, the fourth generation. We have to include their accomplishments, their live performances, their fashion, because that, that's, that's, part of, um, that's part of hip hop culture, yeah. whether it's the first generation or the fifth generation. Exactly. And we need more individuals to know about all generations of hip hop, not just the first. Right. We need you. We need you know you, you know uh, P. L. Cross, Daquan. We need mm -hmm. those type of your your individuals because it's like I said, this, this is a lot of work. Yeah, this, this is a lot of work. There's a lot of a lot of researching, a lot of work. And as a, and and as a, you have to have a passion for this. Yes. And a lot of people don't really don't have the passion as they claim to have. There's a lot right. when we talking, you know, when you talked about me, I have the passion. Mm -hmm. So I have I have the passion. Then when you talk about somebody else, they may not have the, as much passion as I am. They may more more look at it more of a business situation or the money situation. Right. 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 So um, I know you got a lot going on, and uh, like I said, I know you're trying to get get that radio situation straightened out. So, are there any thoughts that you want to share before we wrap up? No, nah, just you know, continue you know supporting what I'm doing. I appreciate everyone that's you know listening to the show, and um, I appreciate LL Cool J for giving me that platform to do my show on because he saw he sees the bigger you know the, the picture. Um, that I've seen it for these tapes and these these type of shows that I'm doing, and um, I've been getting I've been receiving a lot of positive feedback from the Planted Up Tapes show. Um, yeah. Big salute, Diamond the artist. He's my co-host, my DJ. Um, and I approached him. Um, he saw immediately what I was seeing, based upon our relationship with Biz Markey. Rest in power to Biz. Biz Mark yeah. was someone that you know, and he 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 would call me and uh, you know, mentor me and talk to me about taking the tape game to another level and how to go about doing that. Because at the end of the day, nobody don't want to hear Cold Crush Four tape for for no for no whole hour. <laughs> nobody don't want to hear our our tape. Mm -hmm. So I had to find a way how to deliver this content so it could be entertaining and it could keep you in tune to the show. Right. Right. And and keep and keep you interested. Right. So and I, I made a show. And when when does the show uh come on? 
Tuesday night at midnight on the East Coast, 9 p.m. out there on the West Coast every Tuesday night. And then it reruns, it re airs Saturday morning at five in the morning, Eastern Time, Sunday morning, eight o'clock in the morning, Eastern Time, and Sunday night, 11 p.m. Eastern Time. Those are the re air dates. Right. So for, for those that can't stay up, you know, at midnight, you know, I remember back in the day listening to uh, Stretch Armstrong and Barbito. I used to have to, uh, you know, I said, you know, buy two uh, 120 tapes, and now I have to set my alarm. Yes. Turn the tape over. And yes. I just check it out the following day. I was just staying up, and I had to go to work the next day, so I couldn't stay up and listen to the whole show. So I would have to, you know, just record it and wake up every hour to flip the tape to right. catch the show. So, yeah, but it's good that they have the um, the re airs for people that can catch it over the weekend. Right. Right. So for people that want to reach out to you online and follow you and see what, what else you got going on, where can they find you? Um, I'm on Facebook as Geechee Dan. Okay. I'm on Instagram as Geechee Dan Official. One word. Okay. And I'm on Twitter as Geechee Dan 100. Okay. That's what's up. That's what's up. So be sure to follow. And again, check out the radio show. If you don't have the, uh, the Cyrus XM subscription, Go ahead and subscribe to it just so you can, so you can listen to this Planet of the Tape show and listen to and catch some of this hip-hop history that some of y'all are missing out on. Some of those park jams, you know, um, very vital to the culture. You know, the work that Geechee Dan is doing, you know, especially if we speak about 50 years of hip-hop, um, we have to be able to account for all 50 years. So a lot of those early days, you'd be able to reconnect or re-listen or hear for the first time just by checking out his show. So again, just want to take the time to say thank you again thank for you. taking the time to come on the podcast and share, you know, your story, share the history of these tapes and, you know, and recognize a lot of the names that are over, that are often overlooked, right? Because, you know, we hear, you know, we, of course, like the, you know, Sugar Hill Gang, Curtis Blow, Run DMC, but there are other groups that contributed that didn't get the, the widespread recognition that you know they're getting through your program and through your platform. So definitely want to salute you on that. Thank you. And the upcoming shows, we the Biggie, the Biggie Small show is now airing okay. on Rocky Falls this week. Next week, we got the Treacherous Three show tribute coming up. And then after that, I got a show that's gonna recreate a park jam. From 1977. Okay. So we're going to have uh, some of the records um, that we used to play in the parks that, you know, Disco Twins, New Sounds, King Charles, um, DJ Define, Infinity Machine, um, that they used to play in Queens in the parks, okay. 76, 77. So we're going to recreate that so people can get a a better understanding of what was going on in 1977 in Queens. Okay. And as time goes, I'll, ha I'll duplicate and um, we'll do 1978 and 1979 because people got to understand what was going on in 1977 wasn't where we at today. Right. What was going on in the Bronx wasn't exact, exactly, you know, exactly what was going on out in Queens and in Brooklyn. Right. So we have to discuss that. And we have to, I had to show people what was going on in Queens as well as going on in the Bronx. So I have right. different types of shows to, yeah. to um, emulate that, to show, you know, so people can hear, oh, there was no scratching going on. There was no cutting going on fast mm -hmm. and all that. That wasn't that didn't happen to 78, 79. Right. right and like right. I said at the beginning of the podcast, what was going on in the Bronx and what was going on in Queens and Brooklyn, we ultimately got married, so to speak, and all became one across the board. You started having Sugar Hill Gang do records, which they from New Jersey. Then you right. had Quince, which were from South Carolina. Then you had uh then you had Funky Four, you had Curtis Blow from Harlem, 
the Braves, and and then it, you know Spoony G, Treacherous Three, you know, and uh, Grandmaster Fast Furious Five, Sugar Hill great label, you know, and, and uh, so so people need to hear um, the hip hop one on ones with all this as well. So that's what I try to do on my show. I give birthday shout outs to um to our hip hop pioneers and icons and legends, anyone in, in hip hop. I gave a birthday shout out to them when their birthdays come around. I play snippets of tapes. I play records. I play interviews. I have live interviews. I have them call in. So it can be one complete show. Yeah, variety. Variety of stuff. Yeah, I can get a because like I said, nobody wants to hear an hour of a tape. So I had, yeah. after talking to Bismarcky, he said, look, you, you can't, people's not going to understand a Cold Crush 4 tape. Right. They're not going to understand a Treacherous 3 tape. They're not going to understand a Harlem World tape. You got to give them snippets and make and create a show around these tapes. Right. So that's right. what that I makes that makes sense. That makes sense. And I think it's important too, you know, because oftentimes people like outside of the city would think, you know, everything was in New York, everybody was doing the same thing. Right. But back then, you know, like Bronx, you know, they were heavy on, let's say, like those breakbeat records, Apache. Whereas in right. Brooklyn, you had Love is the Message. I remember as a kid, you know, I heard Love is the Message plenty of times, <laughs> you know. My, my, own, my cousin was a DJ. So he used to throw parties in the basement. And I, and I remember that that Love is a Mesh was on heavy rotation, you know, at that point in time. And Queens. Yeah. Right. Right. We, not, we not so much played, in the Bronx. Right. We played Love is a Message. We played um, Runaway Love by Linda Clifford. We we played um, For Airs. We played The Bar Cage. We 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 played these type of disco records more, yeah, just, and we exactly. mixed. We we didn't do that cutting and all that because that wasn't going on in the Bronx. And respectfully, that wasn't even called hip hop back then. It was just something right. that they was doing in the Bronx. And the same thing was going on in Queens. We didn't call it hip hop. We were just doing what we did in Queens. And like I said, we ultimately we all got married and became yeah. one. Exactly. Exactly. All right. But again, I want to say thank you for, for, for joining, for, for jo coming on today and talking about, you know, the tapes and stuff. I want to thank everyone for thank you. tuning in, you know, um, checking out this episode. Hope y'all got a lot from it. Definitely go out and support my man, Ichi Dan. Follow him on social media. Listen to his, his show, his platform on Planet of the Tapes, uh, Rock the Bells Radio. And we'll catch y'all next week. Peace. Right, peace. Thank you, brother. Generation, Generation wealth, 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 wealth.